This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Get two months of free access to thousands of courses by visiting the link in the description. I'm here at the Seattle waterfront where there's a great deal of construction happening right behind me. In 2019, the Alaskan Way Viaduct, a double-decked highway, was removed and a tunnel replaced it. Now, I made a video about this very topic four years ago where I said, the entire project should wrap up in 2020, nearly 20 years after the 2001 earthquake. Well, it's 2021 and the project still isn't finished. But this video isn't about the complexities of designing a mega project. That was the theme of the previous video. This video is all about waterfronts and how difficult it can be to connect a city back to its waterfront like they're trying to do here in Seattle. Many cities like Seattle cut themselves off from the waterfront by building freeways and now they are considering removing them just like Seattle did. When a city like Seattle does remove its freeway, can it turn back around to face the waterfront again or will it still have to deal with the pressures of having a major arterial artery running right along the waterfront like this one here? We'll get into that right after the bike belt. The Washington State Department of Transportation is rebuilding Alaskan Way between Terminal 46 and a new waterfront park at Pier 62. In between, you have a water taxi terminal, ferry terminal, large Ferris wheel, but not London Eye large, aquarium, and somewhat tourist-oriented restaurants and shops. Right now, the waterfront feels a little disjointed, and not just because there's a massive construction zone right next to it. But Seattle's new Alaskan Way project aims to bring cohesiveness to the space so people can move up and down the corridor with ease. At the same time, the city hopes the project will reconnect downtown Seattle to the water and bring people from nearby tourist attractions like stadiums and Pike Place Market through Alaskan Way into the piers. Finally, the project team hopes to make Alaskan Way a new destination itself, a waterfront park. You've basically got three things happening at once. Connect downtown to the waterfront, create a linear connection between all of the piers, and create a new destination space. That's a lot of arrows, and it's just a lot of competing ideas and traffic flows. And this is where the task of replacing a freeway gets challenging. How do you reconcile all of these competing uses? Now, Seattle isn't the first city to contemplate this question. One of the first waterfront freeway removals happened in the 1970s, just a few hours south on I-5 in Portland, Oregon. The city removed the Harbor Drive Freeway in 1974 and decided to replace it with a 30-acre waterfront park and promenade constructed in 1978. It's a gorgeous green ribbon that hosts festivals like the Waterfront Blues Festival and Bite of Oregon. It's truly a destination. That removal was a major milestone in the freeway removal movement that continues to this day. Just two weeks ago, the Congress for the New Urbanism released its Freeways Without Futures report. It identified 15 freeways in cities from Tulsa to Tampa, New York to New Orleans, that have organized efforts to see them removed. The report even highlighted another Seattle freeway, I-5. That freeway cuts right through the heart of the city, and the report promotes Lit I-5, a grassroots effort to completely cap the freeway through downtown and put a park and other urban amenities on top. And a week before that, the New York Times published a brilliant front-page report on the damages wrought by urban freeway construction and all of the freeways that could be removed in U.S. cities. I'll put links to all these resources in the description. The New York Times article goes beyond identifying potential freeway removals and focuses on Rochester's inner loop freeway replacement project. That freeway was replaced by a narrow three-lane road, bike lanes, and housing. Rochester didn't feel the need to replace the freeway with a wide surface boulevard designed to carry freeway levels of traffic. Portland and Rochester offer two possibilities for how to replace a freeway. Use the reclaimed land for a park or use it for more buildings. The Rochester approach to replacing the freeway with buildings could address one of the key weaknesses of the waterfront space in Seattle. The existing downtown buildings that make up the edge of downtown, well, they leave something to be desired. The old viaduct had been there since 1953, and the buildings along the viaduct that were right up against it are the kind of buildings you'd expect along a freeway. You've got self-storage, a parking garage, a downtown steam plant, and other less than exciting buildings. If Michigan Avenue in Chicago is the pinnacle of architecture facing a waterfront, these buildings are somewhere in the sub-basement. This may not seem like a big deal, most people want to check out the water, but the very next thing you do is turn around and look back at the skyline, and these frontage buildings help define the waterfront space itself. The Rochester approach could give the city an opportunity to create a new backdrop for the waterfront promenade. If the buildings include housing, the city could require a certain percentage of housing in this area to be affordable, or collect fees from the developers in this highly desirable real estate to fund affordable housing in other parts of the city. These new buildings can create new definition along the edge and bring the city right up to the water. I'm proposing these hypothetical design ideas to illustrate the fact that there are many ways to replace a freeway and connect a city with its waterfront. These are just a couple of options based on past precedents. But Seattle's actual approved plan took a different approach. Unlike Portland or Rochester, 
Seattle retained the freeway but buried it underground. Alaskan Way, the street that ran along the viaduct, had two car lanes in each direction and ran between the waterfront promenade and the viaduct. It was meant for serving local traffic as well as traffic coming and going from the ferry. Without the viaduct, it may seem logical that you wouldn't really need to expand the capacity of the street. And you might even be able to give Alaskan Way a road diet, with one lane in each direction, a turn lane, and a cycle track. But that's not what's planned. The State Highway Department is in charge of rebuilding Alaskan Way. State Highway Departments are very good at designing transportation systems, usually highways, for moving people and goods through corridors. They may not be as good at envisioning a corridor as a destination in and of itself. That means those linear arrows on the diagram are getting priority big time under this existing scheme. The plan for the roadway part of this waterfront project is two continuous car travel lanes in each direction, a bus lane in each direction, a cycle track, and expanded pedestrian space. At the ferry terminal, there will be two turn lanes. That means if you're a pedestrian who wants to go from Pioneer Square to the waterfront, you're crossing eight auto and bus lanes. This configuration will dedicate much of the newly freed up land to more transportation and potentially undermine the destination program and connection between downtown and the waterfront. The old Alaskan Way also had two car lines in either direction, but none of the other great bus, bike, and pedestrian infrastructure. My question is, if you're adding all of these other ways for people to move through this corridor, why do you still need two car lanes in each direction? Ideally, by offering robust non-car options, you would reduce traffic enough to only need one lane each way. And it's not like this project is ignoring drivers. The state DOT spent over $3 billion to put the highway underground. Removing car lanes on Alaskan Way sounds a little radical until you consider the Embarcadero in San Francisco. They tore down a freeway there and replaced it with a boulevard with two or three lanes in each direction. They're currently planning on reducing the number of car lanes. Portland is reducing a lane on NATO Parkway along their waterfront park and replacing it with a cycle track. Basically, cities with big waterfront boulevards have been taking cars off of them. I understand that these ideas are easy to throw out there. I'm fully aware of the constraints that the planning and design teams were under when coming up with this existing scheme. The Port of Seattle and the state ferry system need local road access. And I'll admit that I think some of the ideas for the waterfront promenade are pretty good, too. In fact, the book Urban Waterfront Promenades, perhaps the definitive book on this subject, has an entire section devoted to promenades built along a freeway. If you can make the space work with an active freeway nearby, you can make it work with a wide boulevard. Elizabeth McDonald, the author, suggests several attributes that make up a successful urban waterfront, and Seattle's plan has several, including places to get close to water. That's the point of a waterfront promenade, right? And Seattle already has many places to stand or sit overlooking Elliott Bay. Uninterrupted movement. Except for the ferry terminal, pedestrians will be able to walk along the entire length of the promenade without crossing paths with cars or being forced away from the waterfront and onto city streets. A place for moving with leisure. The promenade will be wide enough for people to stroll while still allowing fast walkers to move past easily. The space should not feel overly crowded even on busy days. And places to sit. Enjoying the view is a critical part of using the promenade, and Seattle has a great view of the water and a great view of the skyline. The proposed designs include many seating options, including swinging benches, which frankly look like a lot of fun. But as I've mentioned, Seattle's plan may not hit the mark with some of the other attributes McDonald has identified, including ease of access. As the author says, the best urban waterfront promenades are easy to reach. An overly wide boulevard with crossing distances so long that a median resting point is needed may not provide ease of access. Complementing an inclusive frontage, a parking garage, self-storage, steam plant, and other nondescript buildings aren't much to look at. But hey, redevelopment may occur if the waterfront promenade is a successful public space in other ways. Seattle's new Alaskan Way is still a massive construction site, and all we have to go on are the plans put forth by the Washington State DOT. In a few years, I may return to this topic again to laud the amazing new waterfront Seattle has built for itself. But success is not a foregone conclusion. And this video wasn't meant to dunk on Seattle planners, but to demonstrate that there are always multiple alternatives for any new development project, and the priorities established at the beginning of a process can have a major impact on the final outcomes. I hope this video inspired you to think more critically about major urban design and redevelopment projects happening in your community. The graphics I used to diagram my ideas were made using Google Earth imagery, CAD Mapper, a great resource for downloading line drawings of cities, and Adobe Illustrator. Maybe you want to make some persuasive diagrams of your own, but don't have the know-how just yet. Well, Skillshare has you covered. They have courses in Google Earth and Adobe Illustrator, and you could be on your way to redesigning your own city in no time. If you're a total newbie to Adobe Illustrator, I'd recommend checking out the Adobe Illustrator Essentials Training by Daniel Scott. He takes you through every tool you could ever need and really cuts down on the Illustrator learning curve. After you take that course, 
you could take Nicholas Felton's course on designing Illustrator maps and infographics. This guy makes some of the most beautiful data-driven maps I've ever seen, and he teaches you all of the tips and tricks. It's incredibly high quality content, and you'll be designing maps and infographics to sway public opinion sooner than you think. Skillshare is known as the place to learn new skills to make you more productive and more creative. The skills you learn can help you achieve your personal and professional goals. And I just love that they have classes that help you redesign your community. If you're looking to learn a new skill or take your hobbies to the next level, consider a Skillshare premium membership. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click on the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. If you decide to stick with it after the trial, an annual plan is less than $10 per month. I use Skillshare and I would recommend it to everyone, so go check it out.